nearly, they were totally loaded in Lance Armstrong's favor, and he won the case before it ever got to trial. Um, at that point, if you said to me, David, you spent a lot of time on this story, but Lance has now won the tour seven times, he's got $120 million in the bank, you tried, but he won. I would have agreed, and I would have said, yes, it's absolutely true. You know, he, he has made really that sense. But me, my feeling is that at least I tried. I, I went out there, I saw what the truth was, and I tried to tell it. And, and I didn't give up, because Lance could stand on the shots of his in 2005, as you saw the video, and feel sorry for the people who couldn't dream me, feel sorry for the skeptics and the zealots who didn't believe in miracles. He was talking to people, he was speaking to people like, like me. And, and what he did when the book came out is he just targeted in the most vicious way my sources. Betsy Andrea, she was a crazy bitch. Uh, Emma O'Reilly, she was a whore. There were issues with members of staff, issues with with team rivals, and basically under oath, he called her a whore. And Stephen Swartz had issues in his family that made him mentally unstable. He can't be believed. He made up the most scurrilous lies you can imagine. The only time in this entire story that it ever became upsetting for me or difficult for me, I mean, I got into trouble with the Sunday Times. They wouldn't print as much of MA Confidential as I wanted. If they had printed, if the Sunday Times had printed what I wanted them to print, we would have, it would have ended up costing them five million, not one million. That's how kind of uh, stupid I was about the Bible laws. I told them to print the truth, I was wrong. Um, but the one thing that got to me at this time was that in 2004, a very good journalist called Daniel McCoy from Alaska was invited to live with the U.S. Post of Team and write a book. And it was a good book, and Daniel McCoy came to interview me. He is the crusader who didn't believe in Lance Armstrong. It was a chapter in his book on my point of view, and it was very fair. I couldn't complain. But Daniel told a story at the end of the book that he had made an agreement with Armstrong that he would bring him the manuscript. So Lance could have a read it. He didn't have the right to change anything, but he would see it before it was published. And as Daniel described it, he brought the manuscript to Lance, and he put it down on a coffee table in front of him. And Lance said, he said, tell me, is there anything in here that's going to piss me off? And Daniel Coyle said, no, 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 Lance, overall you're going to like the book. You're really going to like it. And Lance said, it's what, isn't it? You're going to describe it in this book as some kind of award-winning journalist, aren't you? And Daniel Coyle could feel like Mount Vesuvius was about to erupt. So he tried to calm Lance down. And he said, look, Lance, this guy works for a pretty serious, you know, a, a pretty serious newspaper in London. And, you know, he, he's talked to me about how he was inspired by the memory of, his, of a favorite song. Um, who was killed off the fight at the age of 12 in his journalism. You know, he, his son has been a great inspiration to him. And Lance seized on that and he said, a favorite son, that's sick. And he launched into this rant of the most personal nature you can imagine, where he denigrated my relationship with John, a 12 year old that he had never known. And that, and that did hurt, that really did cause me great upset that I read. I rang Daniel Coyne and I said, Daniel, you shouldn't have put that in the book, man. And he said, well, if you think I shouldn't have put it in the book, I shouldn't have. He said, I'm sorry, but, but what I will say to you is that what Lance said, actually said, was much worse than what I put in the book. And as time passed, I changed my view on that. I was actually glad that Daniel Coyle put that in his book, because it's there for his for history now. And I think it gives a tremendous insight into the kind of character that Lance Armstrong had become at this time. Why then, given that Lance rolled away from the 2005 Tour de France, seven victories, two more than anybody else, all the money that he, money that he could never spend, it was so much, so plentiful, 
the adulation of the crowd ringing in his ears, they allowed him, first sight as ever, to make a speech on the shops of his end. That's where we stood on that Sunday evening. So why did he fall? In my view, he fell because he fell for the oldest plot in Hollywood. The jewel thief, the bank robber, the train robber. He's been doing it all his life. And he, he keeps getting away with it. All he wants to do is retire with all his ill got to get and simply happy. He does that. Everybody thinks, my God, that guy was good at what he did, even if it was theft. Somebody comes along, you've, you've all seen this Hollywood movie, two years after he's retired, and says, one more job. What about coming back just for one more spin on this roundabout? Lance came back. And that was the beginning of the end for him. The second reason that he, that he fell was because Although Lance Armstrong had an incredible, what I would call, analytical intelligence, he could organize a team better than any sportsman I ever saw. He made sure they were, they had the right nutrition, he made sure they had the right training, he made sure they had the right equipment, he made sure they had the right trainers, he made sure they did everything correct, and he made sure they had a really good doping program. Other teams had a doping program, but Armstrong did all the other stuff better than everybody else. And they won the race that got into Tour de France. What Lance didn't have was emotional intelligence. He didn't ever realize that when Emma O'Reilly left the team, feeling that she'd been badly treated in the final year, she was a very dangerous person to have out there because she knew all the secrets. Why should she go to her grave with Lance Armstrong's secrets? when she hadn't even been treated well. The other um, person that Lance treated very badly was Floyd Landis, his former, uh, his former teammate. Floyd had been a great teammate for Lance. Floyd had won the Tour de France immediately after Lance. He tested positive. He was disqualified. He fought it for two years, invested all his money in his defense, lost everything, came back to the sport in 2010, one year after Lance has come back, got in touch with Lance's people, I need a place in your team. And Lance said, no Floyd, you got caught. You've got a toxic reputation, we can't have you in the team. Big mistake. Because Floyd Landis was then like a, a ticking title that was going to blow up in Lance's face, as it did. Floyd Landis sent out detailed emails to all the top people in cycling, in the United States anti doping Agency, in the US cycling, world cycling, in his emails, he detailed exactly uh, what had been going on in the US Postal Team. And from those emails, the investigation started. And that sort of stuff was about to be brought down. Um, that day, you know, that, that he, he did come down. Um, October 22nd. Um, I will always remember it, as I said to you at the beginning, as being a, you know, a difficult day. A day that brought me no great um, satisfaction. But I felt enormously pleased for Betsy and Breo and all I did. I thought, Greg Lamont. I had interviewed Greg Lamont in 2001. Greg had won the Tour de France three times. He started out so wanting to believe in Lance Armstrong. And then Greg heard that Lance Armstrong was working with Dr. Ferrari because that was a big story in the Sunday Times. He called me up and he said, this is true. And I said, Greg, it's totally true. We spoke. And Greg said, he said, you know, if Lance's comeback is true, it's the greatest comeback in the history of sport. And if it's and if it's not, it's the greatest fraud. And that was, no, that, that was 13 years ago. And I remember thinking, the one thing we can't have here is 20 years after Lance retires, we can't be standing at a bar and saying, remember Lance Armstrong, he went to Tour de France seven times. But was he a fraud or was he a champion? We just thought, if ever in sport, we need to know 
the truth about this. This is the story we have to know the truth about. And because Lindemann made that comment in the Sunday Times, the comment being, if it's true, it's a great comeback. If it's not, it's a great struggle. Lance Armstrong targeted Lindemann and said, I'm going to get you. And Lance was sponsored by Trek. He was their big star. Trek's sales were driving up because Lance was winning the tour. He was such an inspirational character. Lindemann had a company called Lindemann Cycles. Trek, the big, big company, distributed Lindemann Cycles. Lindemann got a very significant income from Lindemann Cycles. Lance said to Trek, you stop dealing with Le Mans, basically, or I'm not going to be your poster boy. And Trek destroyed Le Mans business. That's the power that Lance Armstrong had at that time. He could stop people working with something, he could end people's business, he could sue the Sunday Times and take a million pounds from them. And I would say the Sunday Times have since countersued and I got their money back with, with some extra. So that had a good ending. Great Lamont is now a revered person in something again, building back up his business. Uh, so people have moved on and moved on in a much better way. If I could leave you with the last story about my little involvement in this, it's a, it happened on a golf on a golf course. A friend of mine invited me to play in a four ball. I don't know how you know about golf, but you will understand golf has a handicap system. The higher the handicap, the more rubbish the player. The lower the handicap, the more accomplished. We were playing with two guys. One of them was Sean Maloney. He's a footballer in the He plays with Wigan Athletic. He also plays with Scotland. He's a good player. And the other guy we were playing against was a guy called Steve Guppy, who played for Leicester City and, and, and once played for England. What I mean by that is Steve Guppy played once for England. Uh, but he was still very fish. I mean, it must be early 40s now. And Steve Guppy told us on the first day that his handicap was 22. And I thought, no able bodied man should admit to a handicap over 18. And this guy is telling us he's 22, and he was fish, he's young, I'm sure he's talented. We played in a course called the Belfry, which has been a course for the Ryder Cup really tough golf course. It starts with a par four. Steve Guppy playing off 22 makes a four, which is very unusual for such a high handicap to make par in a hole. He does the same at the second hole. He does the same at the third hole. And at the fourth hole, a really tough par four. Steve Guppy, 22 handicap, makes a three, birdie. We've been congratulating him all the time on how good, how good the round is looking for. But I'm thinking inside, this guy has a handicap, totally at all my odds. With his ability, it actually amounts to a fraud, having a game like that and a handicap so high. So after congratulating him for the second polls, I get a bit tired of this. And we're on the fifth team. And I say, see, you know what? You've got a handicap of 22, but you play like a handicap of four. I said, have you ever thought about this? And he said, look, I'm just having a good day. And I said, no, sir. let me be really frank about this. What you're doing is fraud, <laughs> right? It's actually fraud. And he looked at me. I didn't think he knew who I was for that, because he's never met me before. He went down on his knees on that team. He put his two hands over his head. And he said, please, David, don't pursue me for 13 years over this. <laughs> Thank you very much, David.